Hi everyone, I'm Mara Webster with In Creative Company. We are a year-round digital talk series bringing you the best creative voices in film, television, theater, and beyond in entertainment. And today we are so, so lucky to be joined by the team behind the wonderful ESPN series, The Last Dance, with the fantastic Mike Tolan, who's the executive producer of the show, and Jason Hare, who is the director of the series. And, um, you know, I know that you, you've both talked about this a little bit, but I wanted to ask you a little bit about how you had to completely reimagine the post-production of the series because you were still in post when the pandemic set in um, and you very graciously moved up the timeline of the premiere so that we could enjoy it as fans and audiences. Um, and I just was really, really curious about how both of you and the rest of the team had to completely not only crunch the timeline to a much shorter space of time, but how you kind of had to very quickly reimagine the entire way that you worked and that you communicated with each other to really pull together those last few episodes that were still in the works. Yeah. Well, there was a growing clamor, as you mentioned, Mara, um, by the time that Rudy Gobert was, it, it all goes back to the NBA, ironically. <clears throat> the positive test with Rudy Gobert from the Utah Jazz, Adam Silver immediately suspending play in the NBA. And then by Friday the 13th, um, I think all of us were hearing the groundswell and everybody was saying, we need you. Um, <clears throat> people were aware of The Last Dance. It had been so promoted far and wide. Everybody knew it was upcoming um, for an early June release as scheduled. And by the following week, we had a, a conference call with all of the parties, which includes ESPN, Netflix, Manalay Sports Media, and first and foremost, Jason and the editing team. And it really became clear that it wasn't a question of if, it was just a question of how far um, we could move it up, how fast we could do it. Um, and then it really was a math problem about, you know, figuring out if we're going to do two episodes a week for five weeks, um, that allows us to be uh, actually working into, in, into May. So I'll let Jason kind of talk about it from there because it, it was a gargantuan task, which they managed amazingly well. Um, yeah, I, I think that the two um, things that you mentioned, Mara, were, were the timing of it uh, and, and the acceleration of that schedule and logistics. So the latter was our concern uh, from an editing standpoint because the timing, we were supposed to, um, Mike, if you remember, May 13th, we were going to have this gala premiere at Lincoln Center. So the series was, was scheduled to be done by then. Um, and we were going to make that deadline. Now, we were going to make that deadline from a multi-million dollar facility with all of the accoutrements that you need to make a 10-hour dock. Um, but then March 12th, that was the last time I saw my crew was, was March 12th that we were all in the same room together. And already the buzz had started. Like, I thought, initially, I thought like, oh, the NBA Finals people were mentioning might be in August. So I was like, all right, we're going to have even more time than we thought because we were supposed to air this thing during the finals. So I thought everything would be pushed back. And then it was a moment when this Paul was cast over the room. It was like, oh, my God, what if they moved it up? What if they want it now because there is no basketball? So we did the math pretty quickly. Um, and I think everyone thought at that point, like, maybe the world's going to stop for a couple of weeks or something like that. So we were trying to make allowances for keeping the train going from home for a couple of weeks. And then we'd go back to normal and everyone would be happy throughout the globe. Well, obviously, that's not what happened. So very quickly it became evident that they shut the they shut all the businesses down in new york and we knew that we were going to be doing this from home we have world-class editors who luckily have world-class facilities in their apartments um and a lot of uh, uh, editors and producers have families we have um nina kerstich our archival producer has a new baby she had it during the the making of the doc so she had a setup at home that where she could screen archival and, and send it back and forth so a lot of these things were in place for us already it was really kind of a we didn't know it, but unwittingly, we were, we were planning for pandemic production. So we told ESPN that we could have it ready by mid-May, and then it became, all right, should we back time 10 weeks and do one per week? Should we, do two, should we own the two weeks leading up to the completion on May 15th and just do five nights a week for two weeks in a row, which is what I advocated for, and luckily they didn't do that. Um, but the powers that be, probably Mike included, I, I wasn't privy to those meetings, but luckily they chose what I think turned out to be the sweet spot. The perfect way to do it was two episodes a week every Sunday night. 
Yeah. And, you know, you're mentioning, obviously, the archival footage, which is so much the crux of, of how this all came together. And I wanted to ask you about that, because there's almost been a mythology around that footage over this time, because it's been locked away in a vault, and there's been a lot of in, interpretation and a lot of kind of like fan concepts about what they think would be in that footage. And so when you first kind of got the opportunity to sit down and start looking through it, did it kind of meet your expectations of what you were thinking you were going to find within it? Were there any kind of unexpected gems or were, and were there any things that you were anticipating being in the footage from what people had conceptualized in their minds that actually just wasn't there at all? Well, this was, um, I came into the business in 1998 as a PA at NBC and we still had, uh, this was right after the final. So the NBA was, there was a lockout going on, but already there was kind of this urban legend about what they had recorded the year before. And it, that, that legend only grew years out is that there's this footage sitting in a vault. So I had heard about it. So when Mike called me about four years ago, uh, probably till to the date today, four years ago is when he mentioned that this footage was, was going to come out. He had successfully endeavored to convince Michael and his team to allow this to come out. Um, I was chomping at the bit to see whatever I could um, before I gave whatever my proposal was going to be because uh, yeah, I'm sure I was vying with other directors to that point. So the NBA was gracious enough to let me go into to one of their edit rooms in Secaucus and look at, you know, three hours of selects. And immediately I was I was blown away. Not that it was, you know, you saw all the best of the moments in, in the series and some of them are, are, are you know, captivating. And so if, if, if it's Michael yelling at somebody at practice, that's not something that everyone, anyone was ever privy to, um, but you've heard about. But there, I think that the mundane moments are what blew me away, ironically, a little more because it's Michael pulling up in his Corvette and parking, you know, diagonally in the middle of the parking lot and just getting out and not caring. We weren't privy to ath seeing athletes out of uniform back then because because documentary cameras weren't nearly as ubiquitous and, and personal cameras and social media wasn't as ubiquitous as it is now. So to see Michael Jordan out of uniform in his prime, casually walking through a parking lot, that was like, you know, back then it was appointment television. I, I've mentioned this before that arrival shots at games Michael started that because there was such a fascination with seeing this guy outside what does he act like off the court out of uniform it started to be an event when he would show up at the stadium so they started leading broadcasts off with the arrival of Michael Jordan now it's it's a given that Russell Westbrook is going to come in you know on a, on a skateboard wearing you know a pillowcase or some some crazy stuff like that but it's become fashion statement it's, it's become standard but Michael was the forebearer for so much of this. So to answer your question, I think that the mundane things and just seeing these guys interact with each other and seeing them be human is, is what blew me away the most because that's what we're trying to do is, is humanize mythologize characters. Yeah. Like, like, like Chase, I heard it almost at the beginning um, because I was doing a HBO show called Arliss <clears throat> about a sports agent. And so we had David Falk on and David was still representing Michael at the time. And he said, you know, they've shot that whole season. Um, Jason and I have told this story a thousand times, but credit goes to an NBA producer named Andy Thompson, who's Michael Thompson's brother and Clay Thompson's uncle, who came up with the idea that the 97-98 season, with the Bulls going for their sixth title in eight years, was going to be historic, win, lose, or draw, and that NBA entertainment owed it to, to the Bulls, to fans, to history, to document that. He went to his boss at the time, Adam Silver, who was running NBA entertainment, who then had to go to the Bulls and get the approval from the front office and then ultimately said to Michael, if you let us shoot, we won't do anything with it unless and until you say okay. And if you say no, then you'll just have the greatest collection of home movies ever. And so that's what it was for 20 years as people like you know, Frank Marshall and Danny DeVito and Spike Lee all tried to put it together. I think the big shift in the landscape that gave us the opportunity to exploit a bad word, to, but to basically, um, unpack this footage in a appropriately reverential way was the advent of long form documentary series in the in the previous year there were three gigantic successes the jinx on hbo how to make a murderer on netflix and oj made in america on espn which had just premiered at sundance like the week before i started the journey uh in february 2016. so you know when jason and i connected and we started really looking at this footage and, and as he said, seeing that even the mundane was magical. We started looking at this and seeing six, eight, even 10 episodes 
the market was um, robust, shall we say, which is to say it was very competitive and a lot of people wanted it. Um, and we saw the opportunity then, I think the big, the big decision was we will need to have these two parallel storylines um, because you couldn't do it chronologically, in which case the last dance footage would all be at the end. But to dole it out like we did, made those the little gems that everybody kind of waited for and were, were the treats in, in each episode. Yeah, and I also love the way that you've structured the episodes and you've mentioned how there are things like that incredible footage of, of Michael after celebrating that incredible win, just really breaking down in the locker room after and how you kind of looked to moments like that within the footage and, and kind of preemptively worked to craft the episodes into it saying like, okay, we know that this is what one of the episodes is going to be. This is how we want to structure. So how do you even set about making sure that when you're going out and you're getting interviews and you're coming through the rest of the archival footage that you can get exactly what you need to really flesh out that story that you're driving for within each of the episodes and the overall narrative arc? A lot of it is research. You know, it, it was a double edged sword with, with how long it took um, to get this thing to the starting line. Because for Mike, it was torture to, to actually have to get all the, the people to the table and that there's a tremendous amount of, of, you know, tact and expertise on that side of the business that I, you know, I'm buried somewhere reading a stack of books. I still have a stack of books that I'm going to keep all these books forever that I've read for this, this, this project. But when you stack them up, I just move departments and they come up to almost my waist. So if you picture a book that's that size, that's the size of the book that I had to read to really have my head wrapped around this and know that when I went out there to get these interviews, we're getting every last bit of information that we need because you're only gonna get these people once but you're gonna be shooting for two years. So you can't say, I wish I asked David Stern, rest in peace, this question because you can't go back and get that question. With Michael, we were lucky enough to get three interviews but everybody else was interviewed once. So you had to know, uh, and I, it's a credit to Mike and to the rest of the production staff, we, we agreed on what the stories were going to be and we had to shuffle that deck and decide what order we were going to tell all these stories in. But we had agreed on, on what was going to comprise the 10 hours uh, when we began editing. It was just a question of how we were going to place it and how we were going to craft it. And then hiring editors and producers who were just brilliant at what they do, they helped us to, to put that mosaic together to be um, what I hope was a, was a comprehensible story as, as we're bouncing in and out of timelines. Yeah. But, the, but, the, but the research, um, I just want to um, uh, ex uh, put a punctuation point on that. Um, Jason's heard me as, as the old guy who was studying documentaries with the British 20th century filmmakers 40 years ago. And, and they would say, what are the three most important things in documentary filmmaking? Research, research, and research. When Jason came to an interview, um, no stone unturned. He had everything he wanted to ask and a lot more things that he could ask or ways to pivot based on answers that he was getting. And um, the example I love to use is that he actually threw a phrase at Michael in like the first hour, first, the first half of the first interview. You're still sort of tiptoeing. You're still sort of getting to know each other. You, you want to make sure that Michael um, knows that you've done your homework, that you're credible and that, that, you know, that you're, you know, a worthwhile conversationalist and and Jason throws out the traveling cocaine circus and Michael starts to laugh uproariously and says I've never heard that expression so already Jason's like scoring big time um, and it led to an incredibly really surprisingly candid response from Michael and you saw that I think that to a great extent as a result of Jason's copious research he had Michael he was all the way in and he's leaning in and uh, there was no question he wasn't willing and able and eager to answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like you even see his body language in the way that he's sitting and the way that he's leaning towards you in those interviews, like he's very open to it. And, you know, he's obviously someone who's very media savvy and also has had, you know, the misfortune of needing to be mistrusting of the media at times as well. So he definitely is someone who knows how to not answer a question when he doesn't want to give you a particular anecdote or a particular story or speak to something. So what was your process, Jason, in those moments for still trying to make sure that you were pulling out what you, what you ultimately had as your goal in that conversation and if he was pulling back a little bit at certain moments? Luckily, there wasn't a lot of pullback. Um, you know, when we're discussing sensitive issues like his dad's death, 
um, and some of the conspiracy theories surrounding that death and, and whether he was responsible somehow, which is of, co of course ludicrous. Um, he's a little bit more reticent than he normally would be if he's talking about you know what he witnessed as, as a rookie, which is more of a, an amusing story. But um, I give him credit for, for his candor and, and for his vulnerability, as you saw it sometimes, um, to show us a side of him that we had never seen. Now, going into this, I had seen, tried to, to see every last frame of almost any interview that had been done with him. We had 10,000 hours, over 10,000 hours of footage in our project in the edit room. Um, and that's the 500 hours of footage that they shot Verite that season, but it's also seasons all the way going back to, you know, Phil Jackson's college career. So um for me to see something i had never heard that laugh that came out of michael uh, i had never heard that sound come out of him uh in all the footage that i'd seen so anytime his eyebrows raised or he didn't see something or he was telling me a story or you know for for a doc maker it's it's gold when someone says i never told anybody this but we had a few moments where he was saying that and then of course um there's moments when he gets emotional, when he gets, uh, you know, when he's defending his philosophy and how he, he approached the game and the seriousness with which he approached being a teammate, expecting the most from himself and his teammates. Um, and it, it goes back to the research. I hate to be, I hate to be a broken record, but I think the more, especially with Michael, here's a guy who maybe more than anybody else respects hard work and respects dedication to a craft. And if you can demonstrate that to him and, and prove that you're, a decent conversationalist and that you're not there to get an autograph, you're actually there to get to know a person and tell their story. I think that that pays dividends uh, far out from, from when I opened that first book years before. It was, it was two years uh, before we even had an interview with him that I started researching it. So it was 24 months of reading about him and his story and a team story. And then I got the chance to demonstrate to him, I know this material and I want to tell it in the most comprehensive way possible. That's incredible. And the way that you approach all of the different characters and all of the different interviews, um, I wanted to ask both of you about that as well, because there's such an interesting dichotomy in how they all came together from the logistical standpoint of what you needed to organize before someone walked onto set. And then what you were saying with like your approach to like each person's personality within the room interviewing, you know, I, you know, I know that you've, you've both mentioned how like Dennis Rodman was the hardest person to get into the chair. And then you knew that once he was in the chair that he, you were going to have to work to keep his attention focused on the conversation. And then someone like Barack Obama, obviously there's a lot of protocols that go into place and, and things that you need to follow through in terms of like the fact that he's president of the United States and there's certain things have to happen certain ways and security need to come and do walkthroughs. So how did the two of you kind of work together collaboratively to really prepare for each interview individually in all the ways that they each had their own personalities? Good Chase. Well, do you want to tell the Phil Jackson story, Mike? <laughs> this is, there was some, put it this way, booking, booking was an entirely different job. Now, Jake Rogal, who was our lead producer on this, was wearing many hats. And, and one of those was he booked all of the interviews. So there's 106 people that we interviewed, 108 total shoots, because uh, we did Michael three times. But for from all of these, Jake booked the person. And for most of these, he booked the location as well. And he's also the lead producer on site. He's my eyes and ears when I'm out doing a shoot. He was on the shoots oftentimes. But there are some people, there are certain people in this cast of 106 people that you're not gonna be able to call directly. I can call BJ Armstrong, I can call you know, some writers, and, and, but Phil Jackson was not a person that I was allowed to, to contact directly. It was you go through someone who goes through someone who goes through someone. So, so Mike and, and I had endeavored to, to get someone else to uh, convince Phil to do this uh, and then to find a day to do it. But when we showed up to the door, we knock on the door and Phil answers the door and I stuck my hand out. Uh, and it, this is in a remote part of, of Montana. So you have to fly to Puddle Jump to get there. And we have a whole crew with us standing across the street. Phil opens the door, I stuck my hand out. I said, uh, coach, I'm Jason Hare, nice to meet you. I think he thought that we were two crazed fans who had somehow found out where he lived because he, he stuck his chin out and said, this is regarding and we're saying, we're here for the shoot, and we just want to know if we can shoot inside or we should do it outside. I don't want to say he slammed the door in our face because we probably were walking away when he slammed the door because he had told us to leave. But it was not – there were certain hurdles that we had to get over um, just to get him to sit down. Of course, he made a phone call to someone else, and, and uh, someone somewhere else had, had not communicated to him, and he gave us five and a half hours that day. And it was, it was one of the most memorable days of the entire shoot for me. Yeah. 
uh, were sitting in this beautiful lakefront property, sitting there asking Phil Jackson, who was a living statue, about the history of the game and coaching Michael Jordan and, and his path to becoming uh, the most prolific head coach uh, of my lifetime. So there's so many stories of, about that and logistics. You, you mentioned Dennis. Um, Dennis was not the most difficult guy to get in the chair. There were some people who said no, who we had to convince to do it. He always said he would do it. Dennis was the most difficult guy to keep in the chair because walking to the interview from the lobby to the room, he said, what is this about again? <laughs> I said, it's, it's, uh, it's called The Last Dance, and it's a, it's a docu-series about the Bulls dynasty focusing on the 97-98 season. He said, all right, I'll give you 10 minutes. We need, I mean, 10 minutes to, to sit down and get the lighting right and all that. I need, normally it's an hour per page, and I came with 11 pages of questions for Dennis. And he said he's going to give me 10 minutes. So he ended up staying with us for a few hours too. But um, that actually uh, is where the, the iPad, part of where the iPad into this came from, because I gave him this phone right here uh, is the phone that I gave to Dennis because I was trying to keep him focused. And I had a clip of Michael talking about his vacation. And it was almost like a kid, like you give him a toy or whatever, just to keep them focused. Um, and I gave him my phone so he could see Michael talking about it rather than me communicating that Michael had told me you went on vacation. Well, here's Michael talking about that himself. So when we got that response from him, it was clear that this is a method with, that we should use for these guys. We can't put them in a room together, but we can, we can put them in a room with technology together and, and get the closest possible approximation to that. Yeah, and in, oh, sorry, were you gonna jump in, Mike? Oh, I, I, I just wanted to give a little ma a macro perspective on what Jason said. It played out so many times um, that uh, initially we got rebuffed for whatever reason. It's just so much easier to say no. You don't know who's calling, what it's about. Um, and it just reminds me of my dad, may he rest in peace, who always would say, I know what a writer does, I know what a director does, but what does a producer do exactly? And finally, I came up with something that placated him, which was, a producer turns no into yes. Well, this project was kind of a master class in that because Bill Clinton probably said no seven times before we finally got him. And it wasn't, he didn't want to do it. It was timing, it was scheduling, it was, you know, what am I even talking about? Um, Reggie Miller, who was so great in the show, as you'll recall, and so integral, I mean, he and Michael had such a bond and went, went, went against each other in such critical playoff series. Um, I had a very good friend who was very good friends with Reggie, who I thought was, that was a slam dunk. And there were double figures of no's. Um, and Jason didn't quit and finally found an opportunity to get like 20 minutes in Milwaukee. Jason flew to Milwaukee. Reggie was there doing an, an NBA game. Um, and ultimately it was, it was gold. This was like early February, late January, we got him. Uh, John Stockton, the Rudy Gobert game that Mike mentioned before was Wednesday, March 11th. And that's, that's kind of the night that everything hit because that's the, at the same time the Tom Hanks news was coming out and then the president was making a speech and it was like, the world was kind of like, oh my God, this is real. The night before that, we interviewed John Stockton in Spokane, Washington, which was hours away from what then was the global epicenter or at least the national hotspot um, for coronavirus. We didn't even know the word COVID at that point. It was just, there's a virus and it may be dangerous. And we decided that it wasn't the best idea for me to fly to the Northwest because well, what if they ground flights for a few days? We can't miss a few days in the edit room. So we'll send a producer out to ask these questions of John Stockton. But we were up until the very, very end, literally the last possible day that we could shoot an interview for this project. We started on uh, June 20th, 2018. And we finished on March 10th, 2020. And something tells me that we'd still be shooting now if this thing was going to air in September. It's one of those things where you, there's, there's, no, there's no end to the stones that could be unturned. But um, it, it, was, it was the dark horse pick for the most difficult aspect of this project was just, just getting all of these people to sit down in a chair uh, logistically uh, before you get into the creative part of it. Yeah. One of the things that I also wanted to ask you both about that I think you do so wonderfully in this series, and it's also something I notice a lot in ESPN programming, is the approach that really works for people who are coming into something for the first time and hardcore fans. Like, I grew up in the UK, and obviously Michael Jordan's 
you know, celebrity and skill transcended over there. But, you know, my friend who grew up in Chicago and used to go to Chicago games, and it's a huge part of her family history, was just as invested um, and connected to it as I was, you know, responding emotionally to watching this as well. And is that something that you think about in terms of who the audience is going to be for this and how you're presenting information that you need someone to come in who knows all of these details and knows a lot of the in-depth information to feel really connected and feel like they're getting something new but then also to give enough information you know for people who are being introduced maybe for the first time or kind of increasing their knowledge from that middle point as well it, it's probably the most gratifying thing about the series um, for me and i think most of us to hear people saying, this series actually brought my family together. My wife, my kids, my brother, my sister, my aunt Matilda from Des Moines. Um, there was nothing else on, so she started watching it. She's never watched an NBA game in her life, and she couldn't get enough. And she was calling me because she wanted to watch the next episode the next day and couldn't believe she had to wait a whole week. Um, bringing families together, giving people that distraction and that source of joy in the middle of a pandemic. Um, and really recreating the water cooler culture that is largely something from a bygone era. Um, and that's really a credit to Jason and the team um, and being inclusive, like you said, um, in the first episode, setting up kind of a, um, well, sort of a good old fashioned narrative tool of having an antagonist. Jerry Krause, really a good guy by most accounts, but he was sort of the villain in the sense that he, he was making moves that ultimately led to maybe a premature breakup of this dynasty by creating a rift with him and Phil and telling Phil he wouldn't come back no matter if he won all 82 games. So there was something that everybody could relate to. There were these sources of tension. There was the sense of um, this thing maybe teetering and maybe about over in this year that the, the stakes were that much higher. Again, a, a testament to Jason to being able to go in the weeds and really dissect um, the nuts and bolts of building this winning franchise and all the moving parts and at the same time step back and have you get a sense of the macro of the sociological impact of you know why Michael really did transcend and really was the most famous guy on the planet so um, it's just you know I give I give my hats off to, to Jason it's, it's really great storytelling. I would say this too and, and, and thank you Mike for that but Mike is being humble because the the he was he was you know, one of the figures who had to wrangle all of the partners that we had. So we, we have ESPN, Netflix, the NBA, and the Jordan brand, Jump 23, um, which is not a production company, despite what you may have read. But this is not a situation where Michael Jordan's production company had the final say. It's not. In fact, that would have been easier logistically. Um, these are $4 billion entities, multi-billion dollar entities, all of whom are, are not used to, to hearing no. They're used to getting their, their own way. And from a basic creative aesthetic level, each of those entities had their own vision for what this should be. And I certainly did too, and, and so did my team. So you have multiple versions of, of what people think this is eventually going to be, and eventually someone else is going to relent. No one's relenting in, in that group. Um, I don't have a billion dollars, but I can still dig my heels in like a billionaire sometimes. Um, so I'll give an example. I was pretty adamant that we start this series, uh, if, if the through line was going to be the 97, 98 season, the bedrock chronologically was going to be that, we should start in France, which is where they shot the first footage of this team in the preseason, getting off the plane as global superstars, and then we introduce it from there. Well, some of the partners insisted, no, for the 19 year old in, uh, Japan, who may know who Michael Jordan is, but doesn't know where Chicago is on the map and has never heard of Scottie Pippen or, or some of these other people, you need to in introduce to an audience what you may think is, is elementary, which is how famous these guys were and why they were that famous and why this season was, was so fraught with uh, tension. So we ended up, you know, cutting this massive seven, eight minute tease before the, the first opening animation. And that's, that's due to the partner's input. You know, a lot of times too many cooks in the kitchen is, is notoriously a difficult thing. And it certainly was difficult. Um, but I do think that all of the knockdown drag out uh, phone fights that, that, that we had, um, they came out right. Sometimes, sometimes I got my way. Sometimes I didn't, but I think anytime anyone got their way, it was for the good of the show. 
Uh, I can't think of a moment in this thing where I, I cringe and say, oh, I wish we didn't do that. I wish I didn't relent on that. Everyone really, really dug their heels. And these are people who have a lifetime of experience in documentaries and people who are doing it for the first time uh, and, and, and everywhere in the middle. So you have 20 voices uh, ringing in, you know, dozens of pages of notes on every single rough cut that goes in. Um, but at the end of the day, what we made was that 10 hour piece of work that I think all of us are proud of. Yeah. Well, I think overall, like the audience response and the way that this is connected to people is such a testament to the work that both of you did and, and the passion that you clearly have. And I feel like you could talk about this for 10 hours in, in and of itself, just the behind the scenes. And thank you so much for taking time out of both of your days to, to chat with us today. It's been really wonderful. Thanks, Mara. Appreciate it.